Okay, well, um, before I get started, um, thank you for inviting me here today. I, uh, I was really excited when I found out that Joe was going to introduce uh, Bottom Dollars because uh, I wanted to meet Joe. And so it was a pleasure to meet Joe and his parents. And I want to give you guys a thumbs up for the jobs you did with uh, Joe. Excellent work. Um, and uh, Steve, uh, Craig, thank you for inviting me today. I enjoyed spending some time with you guys yesterday. I learned some stuff yesterday, and I really appreciated uh, this conference. I think you're on a good path here, and Employment First is really important. So let me find the clicker here. There we go. I think I'm set to go almost. So um, uh, I've entitled this slide, Reinventing Morningside, Why One Program Made a Huge Paradigm Shift in Services. When I was contacted by Jordan Malagrana, he's uh, the videographer, um, editor, the man behind Bottom Dollars. And when he contacted me and he asked me if I'd be willing to uh, be interviewed on video and talk about closing the shelter workshop and eliminating the practice of paying subminimum wages, um, well, hey, first, I had no idea how, that this would turn out the way it did. I thought it was a wonderful documentary. And I had no idea the impact would have in this country. You know, this has been shown over 300 times in 40 states, and it's having an impact. Uh, just last month, a law that was uh, passed earlier in the year was finally put into practice in the city of Seattle to eliminate the practice of paying subminimum wages to people with disabilities. And that's really a re direct result of us showing this video, or this documentary, sorry, there I did it too, uh, in Seattle to uh, an open audience uh, at the Neptune Theater and a group of activists uh, took it to heart and approached the city of Seattle and passed that ordinance. So I want to make this really clear that this is a civil rights issue. This is about justice and this is about doing the right thing. Um, we're not living in the 1930s at all anymore. This law was passed 80 years ago. And like Joe said in the, in the video and his parents, back then people had no expectation or low expectations for pe people with disabilities. You know, back then people with disabilities either stayed at home and did nothing or they're institutionalized. But we have come a long way. As you think of some of the laws that, that we've had since then, the Boca Rehab was passed in the early 70s. Uh, IDEA was passed, and the all-encompassing Americans with Disabilities was passed almost 28 years ago, all designed to protect people with disabilities from discrimination. But like all things related to people and how we look at things, it's really kind of what lens you look at it through when you look at this issue of segregation or integration, if you, how do you look at it th th from the eyes of empowerment or do you look at it through the eyes of control? So I think as you look at this issue, where do you stand on paying subminimum wages or paying at least a, a good uh, wage? Where do you stand on segregation or integration of employment? Because those are important topics that we need to discuss, but it all comes from whatever frame of reference you have. Uh, here's a thing I found on Facebook a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, for you people that are visually impaired, let me describe it to you. There's four artists that are drawing a, a still life. Uh, three of the artists are uh, uh, humans, and one of the artists is a tree. And the still life drawing is of a chair with a skull on top of it, and the human artists are drawing the skull, and the tree is drawing the chair. So it really depends on what frame of reference you're coming to when you look at this whole issue. Um, but I want to ask you, what code do you live by when you support people with disabilities? Is it, the, is it the code to say, I want to empower people with disabilities and be included, or is it another code? So I really need to recount to you my personal journey and the journey of Morningside that led us to end the practice of support, uh, sheltered industries and also in the practice of paying subminimum wages. Uh, change, we all uh, humans, we all have the ability uh, to change how we look, how we think, how we act. And uh, Crystal Bell yesterday said it best and how she changed her life. You know, one where she felt like she um, uh, was a user of services and, and felt fearful and how she transformed her life into somebody who was uh, productive and, and changed her life. And so Crystal is a great example of change. And so for those of you that are visually impaired, uh, there's a couple quotes it says, it's not the strongest or smartest that survive, but those who have the ability to change. That's Charles Darwin. And then uh, Edwards Deming, the uh, grandfather or father to uh, quality management said, it's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. So uh, it not only do people can change, but so can programs. When I came to Morningside in 1989, 
uh, my first staff meeting, uh, probably about a month into getting the job, I spoke to my staff and I said, you know, we need to think about being a change company. We need to be a nimble company, nimble on our feet, because if we aren't nimble, if we, aren't, if we don't have the ability to change, we are not going to survive. It's imperative that we change. And when I talk about change with our staff, I was really thinking about change for people with disabilities, the type of services that we we're going to provide and how well we could provide, the, provide those services. To give you some uh, perspective, in 1989, Morningside was the only shelter workshop in the community. There was two service providers. The other program, now long out of business, was the only other provider that could provide support or deployment. We had about 130 people or so in sheltered employment. Um, and so 15 years later, we closed our sheltered workshop and we've become the largest provider of individual supported employment in the state. Uh, not only that, but we serve double the number of people with high support needs. So why after 25 years of building, growing, promoting shelter workshops, was I really happy when we shifted from a facility-based to a community-based program, and why after 45 years was that the second best day of my career? How, how did this happen? How, how did I, I change? So I need to go back and let you know some things that happened in my life that uh, really um, promoted some change. Um, my, uh, my introduction to this field uh, really happened when I was in college. My dad had just gotten a job at Eastside Handi Handicappers, and it was a program uh, east of Seattle uh, in the Bellevue area, and it was an activity-based program held in three Episcopalian churches. And my dad, who had a long career in sales in industry, was hired because they wanted to convert from a work activity center to a shelter workshop. And so my dad would call me up and say, hey, Jim, can you come home and help me? I, I'm bringing some equipment into the, uh, works, into the churches and I need your help. So I, I'd help him call in some uh, packaging machines or product to be uh, manufactured. Um, and so um, I did that and that was my first exposure uh, to uh, this whole industry. But my career started when I graduated from college. Uh, you know, I graduated into a recession not a good thing to do. Uh, and Boeing and Seattle, the largest employer, had just laid off 70,000 workers. And there was a sign actually when you left Seattle that said with the last person leaving Seattle, please turn out the lights. And so um, it wasn't very uh, a good place to start a career in anything. But uh, luckily enough, I was hired at a company called Work Opportunities, a shelter workshop in Lidwood about 10, 15 miles north of Seattle. And I started out as a supervisor. I worked with high school students, uh, going around the community uh, to different uh, wood storage bins and picked up recycling material, uh, brought it back to the shelter workshop and worked with the high school students uh, sorting goods and getting them ready to uh, market. Uh, I loved my job. From the very first day, I thought, I love this. This is wonderful. Um, I became a production manager and then I became a job developer. And in each stage of those jobs and the career at um, work opportunities, I absolutely uh, loved what I I did, but I gained more understanding of people with disabilities, what their desires were and what their heart was for, um, for working in the community. Uh, and so I, as I developed friendship, I became more appreciative and, and um, they did a lot more than I ever gave them credit to at the beginning. I became really impressed with people with disabilities and their capacity and desire for work. But, you know, but back then we thought that you um, really had to be good enough to work in the community. You had to be trained uh, and then placed uh, but the problem is uh, people were stuck. You know, uh, there's people like LaRon Jackson, a uh, good example of being stuck in the shelter workshop because we didn't necessarily have the right jobs for people with disabilities. Um, I know, I, I worked it, I was there. Uh, we didn't necessarily set it up right or we didn't look for the individuality of people's jobs. We tried to fit the person to the job. And so um, now we have this whole new model of placing and then training, which makes a lot more sense uh, to me, but back then uh, people uh, were stuck uh, in their jobs. And so we thought we had to change people rather than change society. I think we should have spent more time trying to change societal views than trying to uh, try to fix people with disabilities. In the mid 1970s, I became the executive director of Elmview uh, in Ellensburg, Washington, which is actually in the center of the state in a little valley called Kittitas Valley that's noted for making a uh, really great Timothy Hay that's prized by thoroughbred uh, horse owners all around the country and around the world, actually. And they had a, a university there. And there was one occurrence that happened to me that really uh, made me think about people with disabilities and what their desires were. And this was a, a 
uh, it happened in a spring day. Uh, Danny was uh, aging out of the school system and he lived in a children's group home and he was aging out of that. And so we're having a staffing in the backyard of the uh, children's group home. Uh, and in the group home were, uh, in the meeting there was um, the, the uh, children's group home, adult group home staff people, um, the case, DD case manager, um, the special ed director, Danny and myself. And I didn't know Danny, I was sitting at the edge of the, uh, edge, of, at the ed, edge of the circle, this oval. And they were talking about Danny, what Danny was gonna do here in the future. And the, the discussion went on and on and on. And I was listening a bit, but it's mostly observing Danny. And Danny got more and more agitated as they were talking about Danny's future. And he's hot, sighing really heavily. And after about 45 minutes, uh, I said, you know, I don't know Danny at all. Dan, I don't know you. My name's Jim. I'm just kind of curious. What, what do you want to do? Uh, what, are you, what do you see your future like? And Danny, without hesitation, said, I want to work. I want to live in the Walnut Apartments and work at church. And um, much to the objection of the case manager by at the time, uh, uh, I said, well, maybe you should make this. How can we make this happen? And so the special ed director started talking about what he could do to make this happen. And this is long before individual supported employment or individual uh, tenant support in the community. And we started talking about how we can make this happen for Danny. And we made it happen for Danny. Um, he got us, he lived in the Walnut Apartments, uh, which seemed normal because that's where kids lived in college that when I got out of high school and he worked at the church. We made it happen, uh, make, make that happen. Um, but Danny was looking through the lens of normalcy. And Danny was thinking, this is what normal kids do. They graduated from school and they work and they live on their own. And I think the rest of us were kind of looking through that program lens. It's normal to go from the children's group home to the adult group home and go from special ed to the shelter workshop. That was sort of what we thought was normal. But it's really normal, isn't it? The kids graduate from high school and they get a job and they graduate from high school and they work if that's what the path they want to take. Or college, because now more and more people with intellectual developmental disabilities are going are going to college. And that point was driven home again um, when we moved to McMinnville, Oregon. So this is uh, a picture of my family 30 years ago um, to help you people who are visually impaired. Uh, my wife is in the back and uh, that's me. Uh, we're flanked by two women with Down syndrome with glasses and permanents and white sweaters and two young children in the front, uh, our biological kids, Heather on the right, probably about four and Ryan next to her, who's probably about three. Uh, we actually, when we were in Ellensburg, started an adult family home and did some respite care on the side, but uh, Angel and Joanne were kind of our permanent residents in our home. And uh, they decided they wanted to go to McMinnville, Oregon with us. And so we brought them down to McMinnville, Oregon, only to find out that there was a waiting list for vocational services. So Angel and Joanne pretty much stayed at home while we, Christy went to school. She's, she taught up in the Beaverton School District and I, I went to work at Mid Valley Workshop. But when there was an overflow of work, um, I brought Joanne to work. Uh, she's the woman on the right. And um, she loved the workshop. We had a large wood manufacturing uh, facility. Uh, we had a cafeteria, uh, the subcontract site. And also on site, we had a, our work activity center that was really doing a lot more work. And so it's kind of the DD side and the VR side of the business. But Joanne came there and loved working on a contract we had with ADEC, which, is a, which was a dental operatory company in a town nearby. She loved working there. She loved the food. And I drive her home and she'd say how much she loved working there. So Joanne finally came off the wait list. And I told the um, program manager, Steve, I says, oh, she wants to come to the workshop. She absolutely loves the workshop. She'll be coming here. Yeah, she wants to come here. So Steve knocked on my door after her staffing and said, Jim, she doesn't want to go to the shelter workshop at all. I said, well, what do you mean she doesn't want to come to the shelter workshop? She loves the shelter workshop. She said, no, she wants to, to go work at Freeland Wade. I said, she wants to work at Freeland Wade. She said, yeah. And Freeland Wade was a, a, con, a, a company uh, that made um, tubular hosing, uh, water and air hosing for industry. And uh, we had an enclave there. And Joanne uh, worked at the enclave. And they made um, coiled um, uh, items for the wreck industry. So they're kill switches. So if you're riding along in your snowmobile and you fall off, it, it dies. So it doesn't go racing off in the opposite direction. And so I had a couple encounters after she got her job that were really strange. So I went to see her at Freeland Wade to see how she was doing and uh, she ignored me. I was like, I was a ghost. She just absolutely ignored me. 
uh, it was almost oddest experience. It, it's Jim, you live with me, say hi. And uh, she didn't want to acknowledge me. And she went, it was, happened to be break time, and she went to the break room, and she talked with, uh, um, well, John was semi-verbal, and but she laughed a lot. She had a great laugh. When she started laughing, everybody started laughing. But she was off with people who didn't have disabilities, laughing, having a good time. And uh, she ignored me. And not long after, we were at the supermarket, and um, up ahead, I'm pushing the cart. I don't know who was with me, my, my wife, or I don't remember who was there. But we were pushing the cart, and I came close to Joanne, and she absolutely took off in the opposite direction. I thought, oh, this is bizarre. She's talking to this lady, and who's this lady she's talking to? I want to know who she's talking to. And uh, we got in the car, and I said, oh, Joanne, I have to ask you, what is going on here? You ignore me. I was basically non-existent to you at work, and now you just ran away from me, and you're talking to that, that lady. And she said, my job, my work. And I said, yeah, you work at Freeland Way. No, it's my job, my work. So Jim, it's mine. It's not yours, it's mine. I don't want to be identified with Jim Larson or Minbav Valley Workshop. I want to be known as Joanne that, that works at Freeland Wade as an independent woman. And these are my friends apart from my, this adult family home that I'm in. So I think Joanne, the same as Danny, was looking for this lens of normalcy. She wanted to be like everybody else, living and working in the community. And so here's another thing that happened. Uh, there we go. So my wife and I only had two biological children, but we had two adopted children. This is Andrew, our, my youngest. And for those of you that are visually impaired, let me describe the picture. There's actually two, there's actually two pictures here. Um, Andrew's on the left, uh, the picture taken when he's 18 years old at graduation. Uh, he's in shorts and a t-shirt. He's holding a longboard. Uh, leaning up against a corrugated uh, metal wall. And on the right is Andrew, about five years old, in boxer shorts, holding up an Easter egg. And so I pulled this off our refrigerator at Easter because my wife plasters pictures on our fridge at every different season. And I pulled this off. I said, Andrew, I said, I want to use this at a conference because I'm going to talk about an experience I had with you. Is it okay? I said, yeah. I said, do you still walk around the house in your boxers where you live? He goes, oh, yeah, Dad. So I said that maybe not as a good idea because there's women living with you. But he said he loved, he would, he'd come home from school and just take off his clothes and walk around his boxers. That was Andrew, you know, that's just the way he was. And so um, this experience happened and he was in our master bathroom and he was sitting up on the counter. Incidentally, uh, he doesn't have a left arm for those of you people that are visually impaired. So Andrew was sitting up on the counter, uh, squeezing a toothpaste tube uh, between his two feet and holding the toothpaste tube. And I started in on, oh, people with disabilities have really challenges, like yada, 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 yada. People with disabilities this, you gotta have real, they have to overcome all these barriers, blah, 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 blah. People with disabilities this, people with disabilities that. Andrew stopped me short and said, Dad, I don't have a disability. I'm like everybody else. I just do things differently. I thought they were great words. I thought they were just absolutely wonderful words. Dad. I don't have a disability. I'm like everybody else. I just do things differently. I think that the most important jobs that we have is to be ambassadors of people with disabilities in the community, helping introduce them into the community and supporting them in the community in absolutely the best, perfect, great way possible, the most normal way possible. That's our job, is to introduce them and, and have them be involved in the community in the best way possible. That's our job. That's what we have to do in this industry. Sometimes we don't do that very well. Sometimes it's good to sit back and ask yourself, how am I doing this? How well am I doing this in supporting people to be the best in the community and how, that I can represent them the best? And sometimes it's best to ask other people if you don't know yourself. Am I being respectful to people with disabilities? Am I promoting them in the best way possible? Am I promoting them as, as capable people in our community? Because that's what our job is. And later on, I'm going to talk about um, getting an outside opinion that was really important. Ian Wally's in Oregon had an opportunity to go to a workshop. Uh, it was a, a, a workshop on transition, uh, transformation, and Joe Campbell was the speaker. And Joe was the uh, executive director of Community Enterprises, a program that was in Massachusetts and Vermont. He said there was two shelter workshops in Massachusetts and two in Vermont. And when he got there, he said he was shocked. He said these four places were terrible. They were rundown warehouses. There were broken windows, holes in the floor. 
Um, there was no work. It was cold in the winter, hot in the summer. And he said, rather than spend time and effort to revamp these and replenish these shelter workshops, I, I think I need to do something else. And he developed this community model that I was just absolutely fascinated by. And I think I learned a lot through that whole process about closing shelter workshops and, and the effort it would take to do something in the community. But uh, Joe, when we left, uh, put his hands on my shoulders and he was from Ireland. He said, Jim, we just got to close the shelter workshops. And so that really stuck with me, thinking about how Joe did this and how he came upon these horrid places. You know, I think those horrid places still exist today. I know I've been to some that have broken windows, that have crappy places, that have pens that keep the most severely disabled people penned up. They're horrid places. The fact remains that people with, with disabilities don't belong in shelter workshops that are like that or at all. People with disabilities need to be in the community, included in the community, and they need to be paid at least minimum wage. So a fundamental thought, a fundamental change in our thought process needs to occur if we think that that's okay. We need to really be thinking differently how people with disabilities can be supported in the community. Uh, when I came to, um, I'll get Andrew off the slide here. Isn't he cute? <laughs> I love him. I call him the schnook. He hates that. Uh, he says, Dad, please call, quit calling me schnook, which is short for schnooky bear. But I can't help doing it. He, he used to be on the soccer field, and I'd say, way to go, schnooky. You know, your dad, he'd come back down, call me schnooky, Dad. It's really embarrassing. You can call me Andrew or Andy, but not schnooky. Sorry. Um, so when I came to uh, Olympia as the CEO of Morningside, I told the county that uh, we wanted to get involved in individual supported employment, because uh, we were doing some neat things in Oregon. We had like this enclave at uh, Freeland Wade, and we were doing some individual supported employment, and I said, I, I really wanted to get involved in sheltered employment, or doing individual supported employment. And uh, the county said, no, there's only two programs. Uh, you can do the shelter workshop in this other program, like I said, long out of business, do uh, individual supported employment. But I, she said, well, you can place people out of your shelter workshops. So we started placing people like you out of our shelter workshop. But another real important occurrence happened in 1992 that really changed my thoughts and the thoughts of people that we had uh, working at Morningside. Up to 1992, uh, if you wanted services as you're getting out of high school and if you're a DD uh, eligible, you had to wait for four to five years because there's a wait list. And so advocates approached the legislature and they changed and they got additional funding and that's funding's happened every biennial session when the budget's passed to get funding for kids that are graduating out of school so they don't sit at home anymore. Well, about that same time, our community was really kind of redesigning what special ed is all about and transition from going from between 18 and 21 and getting people ready to live in the community and work in the community. So the county sent out an RFP that said, you can provide individual support and employment. It's a neat model. We're gonna embed staff in the uh, schools. And so I thought this was great. We actually uh, bid on the RFP, or it was RFP, I guess, at the time. And uh, we got the contract, except there was one stipulation. You couldn't place anybody into the shelter workshop. Uh, wow, okay. Well, I think that's gonna be hard to do, but we'll do it. So we started this program and it was a three-year program. It was very successful. After a couple of three years, 95, and until it's the multiple year program stopped, 95% of the students that wanted to work got a job, 95%. Hugely successful program. We, presented all, not only in our state, but across the United States on this program that was really successful and what the elements were uh, that made it happen. Um, the base thing is we focused on the student. We all had some, a piece of, in this, and, but all of us had important tasks. We didn't fight over the student or what have you. The student was the center of the, of the whole program. But when we looked at that program, uh, we said, well, wait a minute, these people that we're placing look just like the people in the sheltered workshop, with the exception that they might've been 10, 15 years younger but they look just like the people in the sheltered workshop. So it made me think, well, wait, we have a different expectation for these people than the people in the sheltered workshop. We have the expectation that these people can work and with that expectation, there's success. There's a different result. So it really made us think differently about this whole idea of going from school into work and, and the whole idea of sheltered employment. It really changed my way of thinking. Kids can and should go from high school into work or college or something else other than sheltered employment. You know, frankly, we tried to reduce the numbers of our shelter workshop during this time, but, um, 
but uh, as we sent people out the front door, we had people coming in the back door, and we actually were gaining numbers, which was very frustrating to me. Uh, and somehow we hovered between 120, 130, 135 people in our shelter workshop program. Uh, when we closed the shelter workshop, or in the process of doing it, we had to close both the front door and the back door until case managers were not accepting any referrals for people in shelter and employment. Because if we did, it would never end. I mean, we just had to say, no, we're not gonna do it. We're gonna move forward on this. Uh, to quote, uh, there's nothing permanent except change. So I think you heard the video, uh, Dr. David Mank, when he was at the University of Oregon, um, sent some grad students up to try this uh, tool that they had for ascertaining people's desire to work. And 80% um, of the clients that we had said, I would like to work in the community. But it should come no surprise to us. They want to be like their brother or sister, their mom and dad, and work in the community. They want to be work at the gas station or work at the supermarket or what have you. Um, But that, uh, but that percentage is really important. You know, I think if we were to ask that question, I think we would have had a different result. I think they would have probably said stuff that they wanted us to hear, or think they wanted us to hear. So um, I think it was good to have those results. And with those results, and we'd gone to some seminars, the leadership team of Morningside to learn more about uh, transitioning or transition from shelter workshops to uh, a community-based program, uh, appro approached our board, and um, they're all behind it. Uh, when you say 80% of our students or clients want to work in the community, our board responded and said, uh, we need to do something. So um, armed with some uh, great technical assistance money from the state and the county, and also with um, a little bit of funding, not a lot, to help in this transition process, uh, we approached our boards and they, they accepted this uh, five-year um, plan to close the shelter workshop that we called Vision 04. So on June 24, 2004, we had the Bridge of Community Celebration that I talked about. Um, in 2005, we sold our shelter workshop and had new partners. Uh, and if you attend my breakout, we'll talk a little bit more about that and what are some of the challenges uh, that we had. So um, uh, was it easy? Uh, no. <laughs> it was hard. It was real hard. Uh, but we never, gave, we never lost sight of the, uh, of the end goal. And we had a variety of people and everybody pitched in. We had a great people that really focused on uh, this whole plan of closing the shelter workshop. I like this quote by Martin Luther King that said, the ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. We had a ton of things thrown at us that we had to work through and around and over and behind to make this whole thing happen. So you might be sitting there and saying, oh, fine, you did it. Uh, you were a leader. What can I do? So I'm thinking when we usually show bottom dollars, we tell people you can do a lot of things. You can show bottom dollars to people in your community. You can show it to your group, um, your church group. You can show it to your neighborhood association. You can go to the city council or the county um, commissioners or whatever, what type of form of government you have in the county and show the video and get people talking about it and, and seeing what uh, you can do other than have a shelter workshop and pay less than minimum wage. You know, another thing happened most recently is the hashtag Me Too movement that happened last fall. Um, started by one person. Alyssa Milano did this after women came forward on sexual abuse uh, by, a, uh, by a, a producer. And I don't know about you, but my Facebook page blew up of women that I knew, that were close to, that said hashtag Me Too. I'd been uh, sexually abused as well. I think women are changing the narrative in this country about this whole idea of sexual abuse. And I hope it changes the narrative so that it's for the better uh, in this country. Uh, before we um, started our Vision 04, we went through a huge exercise in our organization about changing our mission and our vision and our values. Uh, and our mission statement uh, used to be like three paragraphs long. I don't know if you've done this, but you're in a meeting and you wanna look at your mission statement, so you change it, you change your words here, add a sentence here. Suddenly it's five sentences long, you can't remember what the heck it is. So uh, I ceremoniously ripped it up and said, let's start from the beginning, let's just have a one sentence mission statement. So Morningside advances the employment and social sufficiency of people with disabilities. That's our one sentence mission statement. And then we came up and we spent most of the day, the board and the staff, looking at what our values were as we were looking at where this company was gonna go in the future. And we came up with 20 value statements. Um, I tried to get it reduced. I said, I don't want so many, we can't remember any of them. Uh, let's reduce it to like three. 
But uh, all these values were really important to everybody that was sitting around the table and we kept those 20 value statements and they kind of centered around our clients and around our staff and around the community. And here's a couple that I put up. We support the rights of people with disabilities to participate fully in community employment settings. People with disabilities have the right to work in the community. And that's one thing we could hang our hat on is we're here to support people with disabilities who have the right to work alongside anybody else in the community. And the last really deals with uh, the contributions of any people can make in the community, how uh, diversity is really rich for the community and good for a community. And you heard um, Tiffany, I think, from the car dealership about how the car dealership wouldn't be the same without Trust Jones. And I've heard that over and over and over again from employers where we place people, people with significant disabilities. This is a different place where people are working. This is a better place because people with disabilities are working here. So we asked and received uh, some great uh, support. We had some great national people come in and spend time with our parents, uh, my staff, uh, and the community. Uh, people here, John O'Brien, anybody know John O'Brien? Nobody here? Okay, well, we'll name, name names then. But uh, some really national names of people that really talk about um, belonging and choice and con contributing and inclusion in the community. And have really had some great discussions among our parents and our staff and the community about what it means to be belonging in the community. We spun off a good portion of our commercial revenue into a wholly owned subsidiary uh, that as most of the people that worked there, well, we didn't have a lot of people in those businesses, units that had people with disabilities. We just developed the businesses. But we spun it off into a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, and we really started to focus on, and we kept some contracts, and really started to focus on the employment of people in the community. Uh, it really wasn't a priority to us, our commercial ventures, to be honest with you. The subsidiary wasn't helping us out at all, and they never have. But um, uh, So we really had to rely on employment and what employment meant. And the more we focus on that, I think the better, uh, the better we got at it. So with declining uh, commercial, uh, it really um, made us think about uh, the whole issue of um, paying subminimum wages. And this is... Uh, if I could read this, a couple of quotes by Dr. Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Paying less than a minimum, less than the minimum wage is a justice issue, it's a civil rights issue. So uh, what I did is I brought in Joel Bruner, and this is a picture of Joel. She has glasses, he's in a chair, in front of a park, there's some writing, but it doesn't make any difference. It's just a promotional piece I did at one time. But Joel Bruner was the executive director of the State Rehabilitation Council that I was a member of. I invited Joel to come to our board and talk about people with disabilities and their rights and the whole idea and the concept of paying less than minimum wage and what that means for people with disabilities. And she did a wonderful job. And some things that she said to our board that really struck home with our board that they related back to me. One is Joel said, you know, I'm in a chair and I have limited range of motion. Um, I've been in shoulder workshops and I probably would be at best a 50 percenter. She said, I can go wheeling into Thriftway supermarket down the road here and with $100 worth of groceries and slap down 50 bucks and say, 50 percenter, um, this is all you're gonna get. She said, uh, people with disabilities, their buying power is diminished greatly if they're in less than minimum wage. And she went on to talk about how the challenge that she has getting adequate personal care attendants and how for transportation with somebody in a pretty heavy electric wheelchair, for her to get around, she needs a van. And that van is expensive. Uh, she said, I can't go buy a Yugo, uh, I think she said, but she says, I have to buy a van and they're more expensive, just a regular economy car. I have to put it, equip, equip it with a lift and that's like double the price of it. And so she said, for me to live in the community costs a lot more than maybe what it costs you to live in the community. And I think that really struck home with my board. And so it didn't take much to have our board pass a resolution saying that we are gonna end the practice of paying subminimum sub wages. So like I said in the video, the best, the best day of my life really happened without any fanfare. I got this package from the Federal Department of Labor, wage an hour, saying your certificate's going to expire in 60 days, you need to do this, blah, 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 blah. So I sat at my desk and typed out a nice little message saying, we're not going to renew the certificate. We don't believe in paying people with disabilities less than minimum wage. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Best day of my life. It was so freeing and so liberating. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
that we finally got to stop paying subminimum wages to people. I was really proud of, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was really proud of the fact that it's just, it's just me and my desk. I put the envelope in, I put it in the mail, and then I sent an email to staff saying, um, I just want to let you know what I did. We're ending this practice. We had actually ended the practice a year earlier, but this was formally saying to the federal government, we're stopping this practice. So in, uh, in conclusion, do I have another slide here? Oh. Well, it's a justice slide again. Um, Alexander Hamilton said, I think the first duty of society is justice. And D.H. Lawrence wrote, ethics and equity are, and the principle of justice do not change with the calendar. Again, I can't, I've said it more than once, this is really the whole idea of paying less than minimum wage is a justice issue, a civil rights issue. We need to end that practice. And we really should look at ending the practice of sheltered employment because people with disabilities belong in the workforce. The governor yesterday said there's 50,000 job openings here. Let's help fill that with people with disabilities, huh? I think we should do that. So, so there was a plaque at our old building in Morningside that said um, a quote from Jan Lotzenheiser our first executive director. I wish I could have brought it with me, but it was plastered into the wall. Uh, and it's a great quote. Uh, she said, we must and will make good things happen to the people we're here to serve. That's what it's all about. It's a community coming together to care, take care of its own. And those words ring true today. That's what we're here to do. We're here to make good things happen to people with disabilities to make them fully included in our communities. Thank you very much. Okay. Another round of applause for Jim, wasn't that great? And you still have your mic on, don't you? So can we ask a couple of questions from the crowd? We've got, we've got just a couple of minutes before our breakout session. Does anybody have a question for, for Jim about what he, his journey on this? Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, what's the average amount of hours do the people work per week? Uh, it's about 11 hours. And so we have an initiative called Up the Hours, and so we're working on that to increase those hours. And then uh, what do they do during the other hours? Uh, they're home or they're involved in the community. Yeah, you know, the whole notion of how many hours somebody has placed, I don't know. I. I think three hours of work in a day is better than five hours of work in a shelter workshop. That's where I'm coming from, okay? <laughs> Problem in Washington State, and we're working on it right now, is that people can only have one service category. It's either work or nothing, or work, work or uh, doing community-based uh, services. Could we call it community access? I think they changed the name. Uh, we're trying to work so that they have two service categories, so maybe there's some other things people can do. Uh, after uh, after they get out of work. But people are really, uh, we have a work and fun club where we bring people together. We have pizza and talk about their work and their friends and the community and, and they enjoy that. And then I'm on Facebook friends with probably about 15 or 20 of our clients and boy, they're pretty active in the community. A lot more active than I am in the community, tr trust me. I'm envious of some of the trips they go on, golly. People, I'm going to Hawaii next week, you know, so it's pretty wild. Um, what is um, um, the question I have is um, for people with disability, how much can they um, the wage they can go up to? You know, I'm not a social security expert, but uh, there are people here, right, Steve? Uh, that yes, people there are can people ask can the question answer how much they can question. earn. Um, but working is better than not working. So if you're afraid of your Medicaid benefits, there's ways to work and still can keep your benefits for, for medical purposes. Back in the back there, Steve. Woman in the red. Are you guys trying to work on better for paying people with disabilities better? Is that what? we're trying to do is help. That's what we're doing. I think, um, I don't know what our average wage is that we're paying for people with disabilities. Uh, we usually set it in our outcome measurement and we usually are above it. Uh, but yeah, the more we can increase hours. So this whole idea of this up the hours ask is people, 
train people how to ask for more hours where they're working. It might be looking for other work or might be looking for supplemental work. So we're really taking an active role in that. Because to be honest, you know, when somebody gets a job, we kind of go, oh, phew, they finally got a job and we kind of let it go. So this is really telling us to be more active in upskilling people, making sure they can raise the career ladder and are a different level of a career ladder or something like that. So that, we're really working on that and hopefully we'll do a better job of it. Oh, way over here. Oh, this camera's close. <laughs> have to have track shoes on you there, Steve. Oh, there we go. Rosie's over there. Well, my question is, how many states are you in with your company? Oh, we're in one state, Washington State. We have five locations, uh, kind of in the southwest part of the state. Olympia is the capital. And that's our headquarters. We're in uh, Tacoma. Uh, down a small county, centrally behind us, and out to the coast, Aberdeen, and up, way up at Port Angeles, is up, up in the Olympic Peninsula, uh, uh, up there in Clallam County. So that's where we were asked to come into other counties, but I really had done that. There's a question over here too. But I've been really slow in responding to that. I only have a couple questions here. But back there. Yes, I would like to know, do you hire the person with a disability yeah, it all, depends. it all depends. You know, in our state, they passed a, a, a policy a couple of years, three years ago, that if you support somebody in, uh, with services, you can't employ them. They can't be employer of record. And uh, at first I thought, how are we going to work around this? But we have worked around it. We have actually a couple exceptions for people that work for us that we also support. One is we have a fleet of vehicles, and this person uh, cleans and maintains the vehicles. Uh, and so we can support her in that job. Uh, and then we have another person, John, uh, that does some office work for us, and we got a special uh, dispensation so John can work for us. But beyond that, we also hire people with disabilities. Uh, my uh, IT specialist is a person in a chair. So yeah, we hire people with disabilities, you bet. How many uh, clients do you guys have so far? Well, last year we served about 1,011 clients. Uh, we probably have about 450 in individual supported employment. Uh, we placed 230 last year, 250 year before, and 220 the year before that. So we place people in DVR that don't require long-term support. We also play people, place people who have developmental disabilities into, um, into support and employment. Okay. Yeah, back here one more. Is that where you're running out of time? Yeah. Uh, the movie referred to 48 states still doing sub-minimum wage. Does yes. anyone know the two that don't? No, I'm sorry. If you go on to uh, New bottom... Hampshire and Delaware. Oh, thanks. You know, other states, you know, I was asked to sit on a committee that's going to be testifying uh, to the Labor Committee in the state of Washington, and we're going to approach that and try and get a bill passed in the state of Washington. Question How many job coaches do you have have a working with disabilities? Uh, that's a great question. We have about 100 staff total. And I'd say about 80% of those people are job coaches or job developers. It's funny, when I started, we had two job coaches uh, in Olympia. Now I think we have like 45 job coaches in Olympia. Yeah. And some of it all depends on people's needs in the community. We have people that just require an hour a month maybe of support. But we have people also sort of, I call it hand over hand, where they're with that person while they're working. Of course, the idea is really to fade, right, and, and get away from uh, providing direct support. Thank you. Is that it? One more over oh, here. More. Um, I, we realize that this is going to take a, a, a systemic change in our state, okay. and it also involves a change in business model. Yeah. So that's been the reluctance, is every time we talk, it's, this is the way we do business. We don't know that we can do it any other way. How would you suggest that we approach providers who are reluctant to change their business model because they're unsure of the future. Yeah, I, one of the pieces when I said we're, we're going to approach the, the federal or the state labor, House of Representatives Labor Committee, my part was to take um, what would happen? People say they're going to go out of business. Well, um, my part was to answer that question. So we converted from a shelter workshop into uh, we had some group uh, in, in an individual support employment, and finally we uh, don't have any group at all anymore. So all along the way, you had to kind of think about how you could pare that down and what you had to do in order to make that happen. And yeah, it can happen. But if I, t I told people, I said, we have the highest profits now of ever before we even had, before we thought we really needed that commercial revenue. We don't need commercial revenue. 
We can do it all on the earnings of the, uh, but you have to be really smart about it. You have to really figure out how to make people really productive. Everybody has a Surface tablet. They have to be in the community. So we try to give them all the technology tools that are possible so they can be not having traveling around and just think of smart ways to do it in order to make sure that our staff are supported in the community and that they're well-trained. I think that's really important. Uh, but in the breakout, I'll talk about, you know, some of that, that transition was really difficult for us. It wasn't easy. 